If you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, if you remember a few weeks back, we were working through 2 Corinthians, and you were just amazed at, at the, the preaching that was happening. You were just you, I, you, a little self-serving there. I was going to make a joke, but... But we came to this point, right, where Paul is dealing with critics. And, and I've said this a few times. You know, Paul is the one guy who can look upon uh, this group and he would say, Paul, you've got a right to just simply, you know, tell these guys where the nearest cliff is and, and jump off it, right, to so to speak. And Paul is not doing that. And Paul has told them, regardless of their accusations over his speech, which he didn't talk as, as they saw fit, and the fact that he wasn't charging for his message. So they deemed him that Paul didn't even believe his message himself as if he wasn't charging for it, right? Despite that, Paul says, my testimony, my proclamation of Christ will not end. As he's been demonstrating and reminding the Corinthians how he loves them. And then he asks that rhetorical question, right, all these accusations and all the things that he does and all the reminding and all the, the rights, the things that he has covered and all the instruction. And he says, uh, it's because I don't love you, right? He asks that rhetorical question. He says, God knows that I do. And that's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, as we talked about that. And with that, I thought, you know, how is it? We see Paul is a powerful illustration of God's love. And it's the actions, right, that just he is convinced of who Christ is, and so he, he comes with complete actions. And so we wanted to come back and say, well, what's, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13 in this first letter that he has written to them, and look how Paul is, is addressing the, the element of love. And let's understand it, and let's, let's see if he's doing that in the passage. And I believe you're going to see him clearly doing what 1 Corinthians says. I'll begin in verse 1, but we'll read through um, seven. It says, if I speak with the tongues of men and, and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. Uh, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I gain all, if I, excuse me, if I give all my possessions in, to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. And this morning, these verses, he says, love is patient, love is kind, and, and is not jealous. Love does not brag, and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into to account a wrong suffered does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let me offer a brief prayer as we look at this passage this morning. Father, we thank you for the time uh, you've given to us. We ask that your spirit would be with us. Open your word to us. Instruct us and teach us that Lord, all that we learn would not simply be just knowledge, but it would, would lead us to obedience and, uh, Lord, a greater trust and confidence. Get me out of the way, Lord, that each soul would receive what you have. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So last Sunday, we looked at those first three verses, and we saw that uh, Paul's language, as he says, language without love equals not being heard. Right? You can have all the right language and do all the right things and, and you can speak with right, the, the, just the, the eloquence of angels. I mean, it says it's not saturated in love. No one's listening. He also wanted to speak of our learning, right? our knowledge. We can have a great possession of knowledge. Um, but if knowledge puffs up, right? So people, have you ever been around a person who has knowledge but they're really proud about their knowledge? They want you to know, right, that they know everything. You typically don't listen to them. They become irrelevant. And we are all, some of you are nodding, yes. Don't make eye contact. I can be no. Right, but he says it becomes irrelevant. Here, I'm not going to listen. And Paul says you become nothing. And so he goes on to say laboring. If I give my, my body to be burned, if I give all my possessions to the poor, man, that's a great, 
a great thing, we would say, but Paul says if we do it without love, there is no kingdom benefit. So right how we do things, the motive behind what we do is important to the Lord. If it's not saturated in love. Now again, Paul is not talking about uh, the, the, the love between a husband and a wife, although that's, it's, that's good, right? He's not talking about warm fuzzies and, and uh, good emotions or whatever else you want to say with that, right? And we definitely were emotional beings, but he's not, he's not writing that way. We often take this uh, chapter 13 and say, well, it's, you know, it's the wedding chapter. We read it at weddings, and it's good. Um, but Paul is talking about life change. Paul is talking about the Christian and how the Christian conducts him or herself. Uh, he's saying th- these are actions of a heart that has been redeemed. And we have been changed. I, I mean, I, he comes to these things, and he, as he starts to list and explain to us, here is what love is. We just go, wow, there's, there's a behavior that a Christian has. There's a, a life a, per, a Christian lives. And we come to this and we go, man, this is wonderful. This is a beautiful passage of Scripture. And yet I think many of us would say it's kind of beyond human experience. Right? I, maybe in your own life you go, I don't necessarily feel this way. When I have been wronged, I don't want to extend grace and mercy. I want to get vengeance. You don't, don't say amen. I know we're, I'm stepping on toes, right? We don't always feel this way. We don't always think this way. But Paul comes in this, and he's, he's addressing this, all these, these uh, uh, words of love this, as he describes it. He's, we most, I think most of the time use adjectives. We think he's describing this, but really he's coming in the sense of verbs. He's writing verbs. And so he's not really going at, look at this, let me have these descriptive words to explain love. He says, you know what, Uh, love actually is an action. You can see it. And so he addresses in this passage the verses that we'll look at this morning. There's actually 15 verbs in four verses. So he's not going after the warm fuzzies, is he? He's not going to a subjective thing, even though it's there. But what we demonstrate objectively outside of us, right, how we live our lives, he simply is saying, look, the the society that we live in, our culture that we live in, they can hide this and say they love and do all those kind of things and, and tell you what love is and redefine love. But the Christian, the Christian is different than the world. His love, her love manifests itself. There is something behind it. We demonstrate a love, right? A love of Christ who has demonstrated that to us. We provide proofs. We validate, right? The, we are the, the, the pudding that proves, right? Redemption. We the proof in the pudding. That's it's not an insult. I'm just going with that one, right? But love is on display. Love is a lifestyle that demonstrates I have come to Calvary. I have heard the The words of my Savior, pray not my will, your will be done. And to understand that when he prayed that and when he was obedient to that, that I can be redeemed. There is action. It must be demonstrated. So we begin to see it as you understand these words this way as we'll work through this passage. uh, We'll get as far as we can. I know we're a little bit behind, but or I'll just keep you here and keep going. We'll see. We'll see how many amens we get, right? Yeah. But as we work through this, you begin to see Paul as a wonderful illustration of all the things he's been dealing with with these churches in these two letters. And writing this, you begin to see him, everything he's doing, he is doing this. So the question maybe at the front of this sermon that you can ask yourself is, you know, that difficult person or situation, can I love them? I'm going to tell you, you, know, you may think, in my own flesh, I just can't do it. Pastor, you're crazy. I'm going to say, yes, you can. You can. You know, there was a story of a lady who was uh, wanting to divorce her husband. And she is, was just fed up with him. I, I want to make him. He, she goes to a, uh, um, uh, to a lawyer, a divorce lawyer, and, and tells the lawyer, I don't want to just divorce him, I want to hurt him. So the divorce lawyer says, well, here's how you can really hurt him. Go back home, he says, and act as if you really love your husband. 
Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every uh, decent trait. Go out of your way to be kind and considerate and generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. And after you've convinced him of your undying love and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Then tell him you want a divorce. Well, she thinks this will really get him. This will really hurt him. And with that glean in her eye, she took that, that advice to heart and she went home and did, right? For the next two months, she showed love and kindness. She listened. She started giving. She was reinforcing. She was sharing. After a couple of months went by, the lawyer had to contact her and said, uh, how's it going? I haven't heard from you. Are you ready to get that divorce? She explained, never. I discovered I really do love him. And the point of the story is her actions had changed her feelings. Motion, right, had resulted in right emotion. So this is the identity Paul is hitting at. Can we go through life in difficulties? And some of you are thinking, I don't know, there's some pastor I can love. There's others I don't know. I've been wounded pretty deep. I get that. But I believe what Paul is hitting at here and what he's dealing with, how he's been dealing with the Corinthian church is to simply come with actions that are rooted in redemption. Paul has been called a bunch of names, right? He be, I mean, that's his life. He's, he's going to go through in 2 Corinthians here shortly a list of all that he, he has endured. But he realizes, right, that he can have this action. He can live this way. He can love this way because it's not warm fuzzies. Because you realize that every creation, every man and woman is a soul. And they demonstrate the creator. So he begins in this in this verse, the first part of verse 4, I have it, the first point, I said love in action towards others. He says, love is patient and love is kind. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm driving, I think the word patient is a dirty word. <laughs> Some of us are like, all right, I'm already out. Love is patient. It's hard for us to be patient. It's difficult to be kind. But these, these, I mean, these two words, patience and kindness, I mean, they're two fundamental excellencies of love. Love is patience, right? It's patient toward being wronged, towards what is evil. There's an active verb here, towards other. I'm patient with them. Often when I'm driving in the car, I am the one who is not patient. And my wife is the patient one. She always reminds me. She brings it back to the reality that that's a soul driving that car, Right? I coast, I don't like that. I'm like, oh, let's not talk about that. And then kindness, right? Kind is an activity of good. It's a, it's a passive verb. It's just who we are. It's rooted in who we are. So being patient, suffering has this picture of forbearance. I will, I will endure this. I'll walk through this. I won't give in or give up on you. Whether you've wronged me or not, there is forgiveness. Kindness has more of this action towards others. It speaks to your character, right? Your heart that has been to Calvary. See, patience and kindness represents two sides of the divine attitude toward humankind. See, this is why Paul begins here. What has Paul received from God? Clearly, patience and kindness. He says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? God's kindness, God's patience. I mean, think for a moment, Paul walking on the road to, to Damascus. He has the Damascus Road moment, right? Where he just got done giving approval to the stoning of Stephen. And he's like, this is a good thing. I'm going to taint some letters. I'm going to extinguish anyone who's associated with the way these Christ followers. I'm going to get them. This is why Paul later in his life on that road where Jesus says, Saul, Saul, 
right before he's full, why do you persecute me? I mean, there's loads of just mercy and patience and grace to Paul, but how much love does Christ have for his church? He identifies with the suffering. When you attack his own, his redeemed, you attack him. And Paul, he writes these words, man. He is motivated, right? God has extended such kindness and grace to me, such patience he has been with me. Every single one of us that imagine your own testimony can think there was a time when I was running, right? I thought I was running the race and the things that I wanted, but in reality, I was just running to hell as fast as I could. And it's God's grace, God's kindness that led you to repentance. There is an act where someone in your life, one of God's redeemed, talked to you about Jesus, shared with you the gospel. There is a story usually in in most of of the testimonies of everyone's life. There was a mother or a grandmother who wouldn't stop praying, right? There are those who say, I'm not giving in, giving up. Here's the kindness, right? This is the the patience and love. I'm not going to stop praying. This is what you see. So when we're patient, right, we, we extend this to people. We focus on the person, not the circumstance. That's what my wife wonderfully does for me when I'm impatient with the circumstance of driving. She brings me back to say that's a person. See, when we love patiently, if we're wronged, right, and and maybe we have the power to bring about some vengeance or some type of justice of what we think is right, but instead we say, you know what, I may have the power to get this person back, but I'm not going to do that. We must understand that that is not weakness, brothers and sisters, but that is strength. I will be patient. When we are kind, out of this disposition, it's rooted, it's because of who you are. Often we hear those words, you are a kind person. It's not because somehow you speak kind, maybe you do speak kindly, right? But it's because of who you are, despite the accusations, despite the finger pointing, despite whatever the situation may entail, you respond not the same, not in kind, but kindly. There was an old Scottish preacher one time who had some members in his congregation who were feeling a little bit more uh, uh, mature in their faith. They believed that their spiritual experience was beyond the norm of that congregation. They had reasoned that they were more holy And because of this holiness, they could critique others. Some of us go, "Uh uh-oh. But this wonderful Scottish pastor, and I won't say it in a Scottish accent because I'll just brutal mess it up. But he said, remember, he tells this crowd, if you are not very kind, you are not very holy. Paul sets the tone here, right? As he, as he told us the first three verses, our language, our labor, our knowledge, it's nothing if it's not saturated in grace. And then he says, this is what it is. This is love towards others. You are patient. You are kind. I know some of you this morning are like, don't go any further because I'm already struggling on those two, but we're going to get one more point here. He goes on to say, love, in my second point, verse, second part of verse four into five, love in action towards self. And he says this, it is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. It does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. So here we have seven verbs. Right, And he goes into the negative. This is what it's not. Verse 2 is what it is. It's patient and kind. Here's what it is not. It is not jealous, not bragging, not arrogant. It doesn't act disgracefully. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. It doesn't keep a count. It doesn't keep a scorecard. It doesn't write it down. So Paul is simply saying, right, without love, you're simply not behaving as a Christian, right? I mean, that's what he's getting at. This is it, right? If you, are, if you see these things in your heart, in your mind, well, we must come to a, 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 an attitude of repentance. 
Uh, let's call it what it is and say, Lord, uh, guide me. If I'm struggling with jealousy, if I'm struggling with, I would just want people to know, I want to brag about something. If I want to be arrogant about this and I don't want to be humbled, and that's a scary place to be because the Lord can bring some humility, right? Uh, but this, is, this should not mark who we are. It doesn't mean that we're not going to struggle with these things. I want to encourage you. Often we come through these lists and go, well, I'm out. I was out on love is pay. Before we even finish patience, I'm like, I'm already, I've already failed. But Paul clearly is, is defining this for us, that we would grow in this, that we would see these elements develop. Christ said, right, you are marked as my followers, as my disciples, uh, by how you love, right? Love is a determining. It doesn't mean we go around with warm fuzzies and make it all subjective. No, he's talking about how you live. Paul is talking about how you live. So he comes in this first one, and he says, love is not jealous. Maybe some of your translations might use the word envy, right? This is just setting your heart on something. I've got my heart set on this. It's deeply committed. I have some jealousy that starts to, to creep in where all I can do is think about that one thing. So love doesn't allow believers to enter into any rivalry or competition, right? For gain, I want to keep up with the Joneses. I, the neighbor's got a new car. Well, I'm going to get a car that's just a little bit more money, right? Those kind of things. Love saying no. You know, it's interesting, Kenneth Bailey, in, in his commentary on this, he speaks of, of how we understand this love, and he approaches it from uh, one of two ways. He says, you know, the whole idea of jealousy. It says we can love like a capitalist or, or be jealous like a capitalist, rather. Or he says we can be jealous like a socialist. But like you, I was interested. I kept on reading, right? He says a capitalist sees a man driving, uh, driving by in a brand new Mercedes, and he says, ah, oh, someday I'll own a car like that. I have some envy, some jealousy. Someday I can work hard. I can get that too. The gentleman driving the car drives around the block, and there's a socialist on the other side of the block, and he sees the man driving by, but he responds by saying, one day we are going to drag that guy out of his car and thrash him about and force him to walk with the rest of us. Both men are fueled by jealousy and envy. See, sometimes we look on other things and I want that. And sometimes we look upon other things and we're upset that other people have that. Paul says love is not this way. Right? We're not to, to be jealous about things or be jealous because my brother and sister have some things. He goes on, it says it doesn't brag, right? We're not to boast. It doesn't say about nothing wrong with being confident or those kind of things, but he's talking about a pride, right? We, we know that self is always the greatest sin throughout Scripture. And to go around talking about ourselves uh, is not the right thing to go about it, but it doesn't mean we don't go around and tell about what God is doing in our lives. I always ask when we take up prayers, what are some praises? And then there's moments when we don't hear a lot of praises. I, I feel like going to make everyone go around and share a praise. Everyone's going to share something. Well, I'm breathing today. Praise the Lord, right? That's good. That's a good one. But look what Paul's writing to, right? He's writing to a group of Christians who are struggling with these areas. He has said in chapter 3, verse 18, regarding those who think they have wisdom, he said, let no man deceive himself. If any man among, right, among us thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish that he may become wise. He dealt with people who had knowledge, puffed up knowledge, right? What he talk, he's already talked about knowledge. But in chapter 8, verse 2 of 1 Corinthians, he says, If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. There's still more, right? Don't, don't puff up in what you have. Uh, don't do that. And of course, love with knowledge is nothing, right, is what he says. He's already told us that. There's always that group who sees themselves as being spiritual, and the Corinthians definitely did not lack any of that. In chapter verse 14, excuse me, chapter 14, verse 37, it says, If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that these things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. See, all that we have, all that we receive, whether it's tangible or knowledge, the things the Lord has walked you through, it doesn't bring you to a place that we ever get a right to boast, to brag. It doesn't mean we cannot be confident in, in what we've accomplished 
and tell of others of God's goodness in the midst of that. That's not what Paul is hitting at, but it's coming back to say, look what I, not look what the Lord has done through me. Look what the Lord is doing in me. Look how the Lord has directed my life. See, it's in him we live and breathe and have our being. And Paul will write those words. This is the reality, right? We exist and breathe because God is good and because he exists. So Paul says, this is not about boasting, brothers. It's not about knowledge, spiritual, all those other things. It's not about that thing. And then he goes on just to make sure that we, we understand the bragging correctly. He goes on, it's not also arrogant, right? It's not proud. It's not puffed up. He's addressed the puffed up crowd quite a bit. Chapter 4, verse 6, verse 18, verse 19, chapter 5, verse 2, he's addressed this crowd. It's not arrogant. To be arrogant is to be, right, to have a, a disposition that is unchristian. He goes on and says, it, uh, love does not act disgracefully or doesn't behave rudely. I mean, you think of those when you address the Lord's uh, table and coming to communion, the rich who would show up early because they didn't have to work all day and and by the time the poor came, there was no food left. Right? We don't behave rudely. We look out for others. He goes on and says, it does not, love does not seek its own benefit. It's not self-seeking. So just like the brothers who had freedom to eat meat that were sacrificed to other idols, he addressed that and said, look, you have freedom of conscience here, but don't use that to trip your brother up. He's struggling with that. So, so be patient with them. Just don't do it because of your own benefit. Paul will speak these words in Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 4, when he says, Therefore, if there be any encouragement in Christ, if there be any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and, and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. It's the realization that you're not just simply, God did not put you on this planet simply for yourself, did he? Paul addressed that back when we, in 2 Corinthians when he talked about giving to the church, right? The, the, the poor in Jerusalem. He says it's not equity, it's equality. God blesses you, not simply that your needs might be met. He says there's nothing wrong with being a Christian and being wealthy, but it's understanding rightly how God is moving. Have this mind in you. Use your resources according. Have the interests of others, right? He's riding the same vein here. Do not... Right, go about your life in a way that doesn't, that's just self seeking. Be a benefit and a blessing to others. A few more here. He says, Love is not provoked, it's not easily angered. That's a tough one, isn't it? Right? Sometimes we go through situations where that's the response. <laughs> It's even compounded a little difficult, or maybe a little bit more difficult, and we realize that the anger is not a sin. Right? I can be angry. But in your anger, do not sin. And it's very easy to sin when we're angry. So it should not be provoked. Right? If the situation dictates where you need to get up and leave the room, that's probably the loving thing to do. Don't, love, don't be provoked. Don't come to a place where you speak something, say something, or do something that dishonors your name, and more importantly, the name of Christ. It's not quick-tempered. Right? Be patient with people. And then he ends this with saying, love does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. If you ever find yourself, I'll say this in premarital counseling, and I'll say it to, to married couples, if you ever find yourself keeping score in your head, you need to repent. God isn't, doesn't call you and say, well, well, he, she must love me this way. And you know because God told you, right? And they're not doing it, so I'm going to keep a scorecard. Your responsibility in your marriage is to love your spouse. Their right responsibility, your spouse's responsibility is to love you. Repent if you're keeping a scorecard. Let it go. Paul says these, these great words, right? He says we think 
we think, right, the process of reasoning. We're to think no evil, no evil thing. And this brings us, uh, let's see what I'll close with here this morning. You know, the greatest illustrations in Scripture right, are our Lord and Savior. And these words that Paul has just walked us through, it is not this, it is not this, it is not this. It is patient and kind, but it's not these things. Just these verses. We read in, in Luke's account, Luke 23, 33 through 38, this moment of Christ our Lord on the cross and his words. Luke says, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him coming up to him, offering some sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him. This is the king of the Jews. So in all these areas, we can, we can see, right, arrogance and, and boldness and bragging and all these things creep in. That's why it's important we come back to the cross. We see in Christ what's more important, the soul, not the situation. And that's difficult to do. I realize that. It's, it, it's, it's going to take an extended grace, but it is not the feeling of love. It is also, right, more importantly, as Paul's been writing, it is the actions and the motion. It is the representing of Christ. Paul will say in Romans 12, 21, do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our Savior extends forgiveness even in the midst of while we, his creation, is crucifying him. And when we understand, right, you, you almost get this reality that Paul has this rooted deep in him as he tells the Corinthians back in 2 Corinthians, I will not stop speaking of Christ. And why? Because I don't love you. God knows I do. And what has he presented to them? There was a Savior who hung on a cross. And he was patient. And he was loving. And he was kind. He wasn't jealous, he didn't brag, he wasn't arrogant, he didn't act unbecomingly, he didn't seek his own, he was not provoked, and he did not take into account a wrong suffered. There is the example. And when Paul speaks of this love, it is our hearts, our lives that are changed. We will struggle, right, with this. But when we take seriously, right, this actions of love, lives will be changed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have this opportunity in which to assemble, to, to bow our heads, to sing these songs, to hear your word read, to pray together, and to be challenged, Lord, by your word. But we know we, we fall so miserably short, each and every one of us. So I pray for us today. Strengthen, Lord, our disposition. Strengthen our confidence. Paul would, would go on to tell young Pastor Timothy that he was the chief of sinners. Lord, we never come to a place where we think we're perfect, but we continue to be the hands and feet. We, be, we want to take seriously the, the calling to be ambassadors of Christ. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning. Many of us are in difficult situations where this passage is, is stretching us. 
But Lord, I pray that, you, that your grace would be sufficient. That we would realize the soul and not the situation. As Christ hanging on a cross can say, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And set there upon that cross, not responding while we were jeering him, while we were shaking our fists at him, while we were telling him, why don't you save yourself if you're good for anything? He saw the souls and not the situation. Lord, thank you for loving us this way. And I pray that this would become a wonderful, a wonderful motivator, not, not something that would guilt us, but motivated rightly. That our knowledge, Lord, our labor, our Father, our language would be saturated with love. We'd be patient. Guide us and grow us. Father, we thank you for it. Thank you for being mindful of us. Thank you for your spirit that, Lord, you pour out upon us afresh and anew that we might walk in these ways. And we just thank you, Lord. Continue the good work through this in us, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.